our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome, everybody, for our last show of the week. Happy to be here. We have a special guest, Sam Keen, coming in in just a second. Uh, we are also out on Clubhouse. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I have a special friend on Clubhouse that I'm hopefully going to uh, bring Don't out. Don't scare show. away. I will not. Uh, we have, uh, let's see what else I got to talk to you guys about first before we go. So next week, uh, reminder, oh, perfect time to start the uh, vacuum going. Uh, we have... Uh, yeah, we have Dr. Lucy McBride, and then we have Dr. Bhattacharya in here. I don't, I, they can't hear the vacuum. It's okay. Uh, and then the following week, we have Alex Berenson. Ask and, Caleb. Can you hear the? Caleb, can you hear the the vacuum cleaner? Uh, not really. I'm filtering it. Caleb, good, perfect. Uh, next week we have Dr. Vinay Prasad and Alex Berenson in here. So we've got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, big week this week as well. No uh, exception here. Our present guest is. Uh, Sam Keen. His new book is The Ice Pick Surgeon, which I have some very special sort of relationship to the ice pick surgeons. I think it will surprise him. Murder, fraud, sabotage. I think piracy and other dastardly deeds perpetrated in the name of science. Uh, each chapter in this book is dedicated to a specific to topic. Uh, not necessarily all human investigation with science, but uh, I want to get into most of this stuff. It's very interesting. He's written for many different organizations and uh, publications including uh, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Slate, Psychology Today, uh, NPR Radio Lab, Science Friday. Sam, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. You betcha. So I want to get into your book, first of all. Uh, I, and I, I thought what one thing did uh, strike me, though, have you been writing about COVID at all? I'm surprised I don't see more of that flying around. <laughs> No, uh, it, it came up in a few places in the book here and there, but I was fit to write when the pandemic really so I didn't really plan on having anything like that in the uh, in the book. Got so it. It didn't quite have a spot. Got it. Have yeah. you been writing? Have you been writing about COVID in any other publications? Because I, I think you seem like such a great science writer. I'd just be curious your thoughts. Not really. Um, I mean, it's been covered so heavily, and I just yeah. kind of, uh, yeah, I, I write a little bit more about history and things like that, so I just kind of uh, let that right. go for other people. I get it. I get it. So let's get into <laughs> history. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, Abraham Lincoln was the target of body snatchers, I believe twice, and so was Mary, I believe, or at least they had to hide Mary with Abe at one point. Uh, that's one chapter in your book. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was a little anecdote that I mentioned in there. Um, Abe Lincoln was the plot, or uh, was the uh, target, actually, of some body snatchers. Um, this was a little bit of a, a tangent, but, you know, I love tangents in my book, so it was kind of fun to do. Um, basically, there was a group of counterfeiters who decided that uh, one of their buddies in jail, they wanted to get him out of jail, wanted to spring him. And they came up with, <laughs> excuse me, kind of a cockamamie plan, which was to break into Lincoln's tomb, which was not very well guarded, uh, steal Lincoln's body and hold it for ransom until their buddy got sprang from jail. And I kind of put that in the context of body snatching in general in the United States and Great Britain, because it was a pretty big problem for a very long time, especially among doctors, anatomists, medical students, people who needed to uh, basically have bodies to dissect to understand how the human body worked. And there was a lot of body snatching going on. This was just one sort of a kind of fun anecdote side note to that. So, so most of it was in the name of science. It's funny, we, we, I'm remembering, I've forgotten now, many, many, many years ago, um, when we were in second year medical school, we did a skit for the incoming first year students that they were going to have to each find a body uh, to, to do their anatomy <laughs> lab. 
And uh, we had planted in the audience, you know, other second year students going, you know, my uncle really sick. I mean, how soon do you need the, how soon do you need the body? Okay. <laughs> this kind of stuff. But we, yeah. you know, who that would not we have been a joke uh, a few hundred years ago, actually. Yeah. I understand. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the body snatching, and my understanding is the reason those dudes got caught is one of them went in a bar, got drunk, and started bragging about what they were doing. And they nearly pulled it off. And they ended, they is, I don't remember the details, but they ended up hiding Mary and Abe in like somebody's basement for a long time. And then what they finally decided to do, there's a whole um, possibly apocryphal story about how they eventually, now he's under concrete, like three stories of concrete. They decided yes. they were just going to put a put an end to all this. Um, but there is a story of a child, of a 13 year old being told by an old farmer in Springfield going, Hey, you may want to go over to the cemetery and something's going on. You may want to take a look at what they're doing. And what they were doing was doing the final viewing of Lincoln's body to identify him, to make sure it was him before they put him under all the concrete. And this 13 year old reported years wow. later as an old man, that there was Abe Lincoln completely intact with the mole on his face, the hair, the beard, everything was completely mm -hmm. there. He, he, would, he said he looked in the coffin and was shocked to see old Abe sitting there uh, just himself. Yep. <laughs> and now to keep him safe, he's under concrete. Um, and, and the idea of an ice pick surgeon, are you talking about the uh, Nobel Prize winners that developed the, uh, the frontal lobotomy? Yes, uh, Agus Moniz uh, was the Nobel Prize winner, but especially in the book, I talk about Walter Freeman, who was the very uh, notorious doctor associated with the lobotomy. Um, Moniz actually called it a little different procedure. He called it a leucotomy, I think. And it was really Freeman, uh, the one that made the lobotomy the notorious procedure that we all know today. So the chapter touches on both of them, but look, Freeman is really the focus of the chapter. So I worked in a psychiatric hospital from the early 80s on and took care of a number of lobotomy patients uh, now wow, in their 80s, really? 70s, and 80s. <clears throat> Singulotomy, lobotomy, it was a freaking disaster. Uh, they develop <clears throat> gliosis around, so they get scarring or called gliosis around the wounds. And so they all develop progressive dementias and weird inability to take care of themselves, very protean weird syndromes but complete devastation from, from the lobotomies. Mm -hmm. And it was also clear to me getting to know both the patients and their history. They were either or, and drug addict, alcoholics or borderline personality disorder. That was it. Troublesome people. Oh, interesting. Troublesome people. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Which yeah. is really what they were. And, and there's a, there's a story on the lobotomies that uh, of course, Rose um, Kennedy had a lobotomy, right? Rosemary. Yep. Rose Kennedy and, JFK and sister. Yeah, she, late in her. That's right. Go ahead. Yeah. So she um, was the she had, she had kind of a harrowing birth in that. Uh, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy today, but when her mother was giving birth to her, there was no doctor around. And at the time, they were very deferential to doctors. You know, there had to be a doctor there. And the midwife actually started pushing the baby back up inside her mother in order to wait for the doctor to get there. Sadly, the umbilical oh cord ended up getting wrapped around her neck. Uh, oxygen got cut off to her brain for a while. And she ended up with some brain damage. Uh, she was always a bit slow, you know, had trouble riding a bike, a little bit clumsy with utensils, things like that. But overall, she was okay. She just had a few, you know, sort of slow developmental issues. Unfortunately, the father, Joseph Kennedy, considered her an embarrassment. Uh, at the time, he figured he had to have a perfect family. There was no room for any sort of um, issues, things like that. And so he decided to lock her away in a convent. And naturally, she didn't like this. She started rebelling, started escaping at night, running around. And they got very worried that she was going to essentially embarrass the family. And so uh, Joseph Kennedy got in touch with Walter Freeman and arranged for Rosemary to have a lobotomy. And as you said, it was a, basically a complete disaster. Um, I don't know what you saw, if you noticed this in the patients, maybe if you didn't know them before, but the thing they really mentioned with a lot of the patients that Freeman worked on was that they lost what he called their spark. 
back in that they just didn't have much initiative afterward. Uh, you couldn't really get them to do anything. If you asked them, hey, you want to go for a walk or something? They would say, oh, okay, fine. They would just go along with you, follow along with you. But they would never initiate that on their own. And that was the big symptom that Freeman talked about that a lot of them lost was this initiative, this spark. They just sort of existed instead of having volition and things that we would normally associate with a full functioning human life. Right. They were no longer a problem. Crazy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> super crazy, I got to tell you. Uh, and it gets and, and the mom, Rose Kennedy, said in her in her in her very advanced years, that worse than losing her two sons was what they did to Rosemary. She said that was the most. Oh, that's very sad. Yeah. For her. Isn't yeah. that interesting? I remember JFK and, actually and had to. He had to. JFK on the campaign tra trail uh, actually had to sneak away at one point just to visit Rosemary. They had locked her away in an institution in Wisconsin, and essentially no one was allowed to visit her or acknowledge her. So I, that, it's a very sad story. And the reason Dr. Brown, who was the head of the National Institute of Mental Health or created the National Institute of Mental Health, was able to manipulate Kennedy into signing the Community Mental Health Act was because of Rosemary. He, he felt so much yeah, that, that was guilt a, a big and concern on about him. it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so Freeman was a nut. He would carry <laughs> the ice picks in his coat pocket, not sterilized, in his coat pocket. He would pull them out. He'd hold the patient's head. You may be able to find, I can probably show you a picture of it, Caleb. You can put it up there, it'll freak people out. You drop the head over the side of the bed. He'd put the ice pick above the eye here, take a hammer, hammer it in, and then sweep mm -hmm. it up and back to make sure to disconnect the Yummy. frontal lobes of the brain. If the patient wasn't confused and vomiting, he would do it again, which is an unbelievable story that I, I this kind of thing I heard. Yeah, it's unbelievable. What, the little piece yeah. that I could read between the lines, sort of reading the history, it was history I was very interested in because I was seeing these patients. The neurosurgeons at the time were freaking the hell out. I could, I could see it in the, what they were writing and their lack of willingness to communicate with Freeman. They were like, oh, my God, you he's doing yeah. neurosurgery with an ice pick. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> the neurosurgeons yeah. just, just went into, like, fr freeze mode much like primary care doctors during COVID, they just stopped talking and they sort of were mumbling amongst themselves. You could see that they were like mortified. And psychiatry, which has always had this problem where they want to be doctors, you know, they want to be medicalizing mental health care. And, and so psychosurgeries, and, and I'm not against that. I am, I am, I think that's a, a viable sort of uh, pursuit but in their enthusiasm to do that, they they did some crazy stuff, and psychosurgeries was one of them. Am, am I characterizing that about right? Yeah, in the book, you can actually see there's a famous picture of Freeman where he is operating, doing neurosurgery, without gloves, without a face mask, and there is just a zoo of people around him. There are probably 20 to 30 people yeah. in the picture because and, and he would he go hammer, to these asylums. And he has his hammer. Yeah, and he, he's hammering it yeah. right in there. He would go to these asylums, yeah. <laughs> usually in rural places, where they wanted to essentially empty them out. And he would call up reporters. There'd be people right there. He would line up 15, 20 patients. He would sometimes see how many of them he could do in a day. His record was 25 in a day. There are also stories he was fairly ambidextrous. So he could do two of them at the same <laughs> two time. Oh, yeah, two oh at once. God. To be more efficient. I mean, basically oh just to show God. off to reporters. People Drew, is this faint. the photo? <laughs> is this the one you're looking Let's for? See, hold on, they're going to put. The, it's like a diagram. No, that's the that's the article. No, no, no. Well, that's he's showing where the ice pick goes from the eye up. If you yeah. just look, but you can look get an up idea Freeman yeah. ice pick. Yeah, yeah, just look up Freeman ice pick, and uh, you will see him in the oh, a bunch of pictures. The picture, if you go to images, the picture in the lower left corner with him in his shirt sleeves with a hammer. You, you'll see the picture I want to show, or that uh, that uh, Sam's talking about. When faces yeah. made the case for lobotomy. Do you, do you have it there, Caleb? I'm looking I have for it. it. I don't know if I could. Uh, how do I get it to you? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, anyway, uh, were there were there any? I mean, I I'm sympathetic to so many of the things that you are writing about. Were there any surprises for you as you wrote the book? Um, 
I was a little surprised that, you know, there were a lot of different fields where these kind of things came up. I expected it, you know, to happen in medicine because you're dealing with individuals, you're dealing with people. It's sort of a human science. But there were stories in the book about, you know, physics, botany, um, just all sorts of different areas of science where you see people basically abusing their privileges like this. What, what, do you have this a one. way of thinking about, that's the one, you got it. So yeah. there he is in his shirt sleeves, uh, taking the pick and pushing it into the patient's eye. On the same page where you found this, uh, Caleb, look at the second row of pictures on the far, the furthest to the right, where he's got his finger over an eye and uh, a thing jammed into somebody's eye. Can you see that? Anyway, yeah, I don't want to get too up. crazy with all this. Somebody yeah, on Restream he's... said that picture looks very similar to the COVID home test instructions. I thought. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Who said that? That's clever. Uh, let's see. It's a uh, Mew Mew 911 oh, on Twitch. Mew Mew. That's very funny. Uh, let's even get the other <laughs> picture up there, Caleb. Uh, any event. Um, so what? How do you? What do you think is going on? Because these are not people who go out with the intention to harm people. Uh, their intention yeah. is to help, but it, it always feels like their their enthusiasm, their insulation by their professional societies that sort of fawn over new techniques no 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 i'm talking about the one where there's a person that they're doing that to um and and, and their ego right i mean those are the things that mm -hmm. seem to happen is it do you have a way of thinking about why people go down these paths yeah i think that that that's a pretty good succinct characterization of it uh i do talk about some of the uh common psychologies that you see with the people who mm. do uh, essentially commit these crimes in the name of science. Uh, ego is a big one. Um, they're very good about um, sort of tunneling, they have tunnel vision, they kind of, everything else gets blocked out and they're just focused on getting results, getting research. They tend to sort of dehumanize their patients in some way. Uh, I remember there was a quote from a doctor who studied syphilis where he said his idea of heaven was unlimited syphilis and unlimited means to experiment on it. So people to him, essentially, mm. they were just these biological systems where he could run experiments on them. And he, in fact, pushed back against the idea of using penicillin on people, even though it cured it, because he got to the point where he just wanted to see how far things went with syphilis. He wanted to see the end stages of it. So really, they were blocking out the people involved. In it. And yeah, yeah, I shake my head too. It's kind of a hard thing to imagine when you're a doctor and you care more about the biology than you do the patient behind it. I, I can imagine people with, uh, like the, this, the Nick, the TV show to me was another sort of version of this, which is these guys didn't have much to do. Everybody was dying. So they were trying everything they could, you know, and they, and in doing so, they tried some wild things. I, I think it mm. kind of started there because so much of this was a 20th century phenomenon where, where the, I don't know, the, the, the physician or particularly the surgeon became deified in certain ways. And the reality mm. is there wasn't much to be done. People were dying all over the place. And so if you could do anything, you were doing something. And if they died sooner, oh, well. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it was a weird psychology yeah. that was taking hold. I thought the Nick, I thought the Nick portrayed that very, very well. But go ahead. Yeah, and you, I mean, you mentioned the Nobel Prize winner Agus Moniz. When lobotomies got started, they were in a way defensible in that there was essentially no other treatment for people in asylums. They were locked away in straitjackets in padded rooms a lot of them were seeing things they could not be around other people they could not go outside it was a very sad life and doctors were desperate they had no way to help them and lobotomies like as you said it was kind of a, a desperate gamble but they had no other options and so at the beginning in some cases lobotomies were somewhat defensible freeman just took things way too far and essentially, right. uh, someone once called him the Henry Ford of lobotomies, and he loved that. He was mass producing them. He wanted to bring them to the masses. And that's what he did. He was too ambitious. He went way too far. And so when we think about, again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why people do this and you know how, how science can go wrong and what we need to 
sort mm -hmm. of uh, buttress ourselves against, you know, be prepared to see these excesses develop. Same thing happened with the opioid epidemic. You know, when, when there were, what happened was there was a woman named Foley who was an excellent physician and brought palliative care to cancer patients in the, really it was the early 80s. And so, I mean, we weren't treating cancer pain. Can you imagine that? We were not treating it. It's just unthinkable. She she brought it in. It was the right thing to do. She thought Purdue Pharmaceuticals were was a godsend because we could take we could more effectively treat cancer pain. The problem is, the enthusiasm came in. Pain became whatever the patient says it is. Pain became the fifth vital sign. Pain control became whatever the patient says it is. Well, now you have these giant mills where you don't even need doctors because it's the patient's decision what pain control is. So just get a menu and have the patient pick what they want. That's where we ended <laughs> yeah. up from treating cancer pain to having a counter where you could get your dilaudid. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah, you can see basically how, where things started and each step, how, uh, at each step, you can see why they made the decisions they made. But you look back yeah. at the end where you started and you, you, there's a big gap there and you can see all of the sort of the, the mistakes that were made along the way. And you can see the commonalities in case after case. My deepest fear is that we're doing something like that in the present moment with our pandemic. Uh, a lot of silly mm -hmm. decisions uh, that that are being j just jammed down people's throats and accelerated through with enthusiasm without any discussion or temperance. And I, I, it, to me, this feels the same. Having been through the opioid crisis, having been through these, you know, having taken care of the lobotomy patients and been aware of how how that went down on patients, so to speak. So I, I am gravely concerned. And by the way, in none of those cases, I don't think in any of the cases, maybe Mangala, but I don't really think in any of the cases that you review was really the government involved with any of it. It really was the medical profession or the scientific community that perpetrated things without the help of government. Is that accurate? Uh, there were that, accurate for the most part. There were a few cases such as the Tuskegee study and then the Guatemala syphilis study after that, where it was a government agency, the uh, public health service, and then it became the CDC, who were actually running the experiment. So in that case, you do have a government entity running it. But for the most part, you are right. It was usually individual doctors who were kind of working on their own, and the medical profession was the one who policed them or failed to in some cases. Yeah, I, I th always thought before the present moment, I always thought of the CDC as just advisory to the medical profession. I, I, I saw them as funded by the government, but really part of the medical community. So that's kind of interesting. So tell them about the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, this is Tuskegee Appar uh, experiment. experiment. I, I, that's a word that hard to get a second word out after. That's amazing. And, and, you can't uh, pronounce and it, something. And the, the misconception that people often sort of throw out there in relation to the Tuskegee experiment is they will mention the Tuskegee airmen, which have nothing to do with this. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I talk about that a bit in the book. It is sad that uh, the Tuskegee experiments kind of besmirched the name of Tuskegee because it was once a, very, uh, a source of pride in the black community. You had the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, you had a lot of civil rights uh, movement in the era. I believe Rosa Parks even was from there. I mean, it was a very, very proud name. And now, unfortunately, it's infamous because of the uh, this experiment. Uh, basically, what they did was they had very high rates of syphilis in the Tuskegee area. And they went in and they decided what they were going to do is they were going to monitor the syphilis basically till it got to the end stages. And in a way, again, at the beginning, they did have some good intentions. They were trying to look at whether Tuske or whether uh, syphilis affected uh, black people versus white people in different ways. And there were some indications at the time that uh, maybe syphilis was a little better left alone in that the drugs used at the time to treat syphilis were things that had mercury in them, things that had arsenic in them, very harsh drugs. So at the beginning, it was just an observation study. Where it went bad was later in that penicillin came around, which was obviously much less harsh than mercury or arsenic drugs, but they didn't tell these people. 
and um, yeah, and more effective too, definitely. Uh, but they didn't tell the people that penicillin was available. They didn't tell them that they could maybe cure this disease. In some cases, they didn't even tell them they had syphilis. Uh, they would lure them into the mm -hmm. clinic by saying, hey, we're going to give you this free special treatment. Well, it turned out it was just a spinal tap because they wanted to monitor the syphilis and they weren't treating them at all. So they lied to them, they withheld yeah. information from them and didn't give them the best standards of care. And that's why it became mm. such a big scandal when it was finally exposed in the 1970s. And was it the nurse that exposed it? I thought there was a young researcher that came upon it and went, hey, we got it. This is not okay. There, were, there was a kind of a weird mix. There was a... Someone, I think, on the the advisory board, I'm trying to remember now, someone on someone who, who was involved with the public health service uh, basically yeah. was reading about these experiments and said, this this is crazy. We, we can't do this. Went to yeah. actually the New York yeah. Times and the Washington Post, and they said, ah, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they blew him off. Finally, he convinced an AP mm -hmm. reporter in the early 70s to write a story about it. She wrote a story about it, and that's when it kind of exploded. So they were they were actually publishing this in medical journals. New York Times, Washington Post blew it off. There were people out there who knew about it, but just no one really cared for a while. Yeah. So there are a couple of things I don't know much about that you wrote about. Uh, talk to me about John Mooney and his work with transgender. Yeah, so John, uh, is it Mooney? I, I thought it was money, but it might have been. <laughs> money, money, I beg your pardon. Yep, it's money. Yep. Okay, money. Um, so John Money was a scholar, he was from New Zealand, who was very big in the, uh, I guess he got his name really going with uh, transgender people. So uh, people who are biologically one sex but feel themselves to be another a gender, I should say, uh, biologically one sex feel themselves to be another gender. And he was really the first person to champion these people and to say, you know, they, they are just normal everyday people and we shouldn't, you know, uh, they were often called freaks before, very, very harsh treatment for them. And he was the one who kind of normalized them. Unfortunately, like the other cases in the book, he often took things way too far, and he was linked to a notorious experiment involving two twins from Winnipeg in Canada in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, essentially, there was a botched circumcision on one of them, and this poor little mm -hmm. kid lost his penis. It burned off, fell off, and the parents didn't know what to do. And so John Money heard about this case and essentially told the parents that based on his expertise, on his research, that uh, sex, gender, all of that had no biological basis whatsoever. And that what they should do with this boy who had lost his penis was that they should raise the boy as a girl, uh, but without telling her anything about her past. So essentially raise her as a girl and, I think and they she did, would be completely I think fine. They did a did a little genital reassignment surgery or something too, didn't they, on this one? They, they did, yes. Uh, they removed the, the scrotum and the testicles. They tried to fashion sort of a rudimentary vagina. Uh, and then they basically mm -hmm. tried to raise the boy as a girl. And according to John Money's theories, uh, there would be no problems whatsoever. Uh, and you can imagine what happened. The little boy had all sorts of problems, never quite felt right, always felt kind of strange, and ended up having a harrowing, terrible, awful life until finally, uh, around the age of 14, uh, the parents broke down and told her what was happening. And finally, she felt like she understood her life, understood what was going on, but these psychological scars ran very, very deep. And actually, both she, uh, later he, and his brother ended up killing themselves because of the deep psychological scars they had from their treatment, not only being raised by that, but they had to go into Money's office all the time. And Money was frankly kind of a monster to them. He would make them, you know, pose in sexual positions to try to train them in the proper way to like masculize or feminize them. I mean, he was really, really an awful manipulative person but he just had this kind of cachet and people trusted him and just let him do whatever he wanted. Again, just beware excesses in medicine, anything excessive, whether it's just beware, guys. Um, 
And oh, I just, I just, just taking my breath away. You mentioned the brother. Why was he involved with that? Uh, the brother was involved because essentially money, uh, as we were talking about, did not view them as people as much as an experiment. And he viewed the brother, he thought, aha, a twin brother, a perfect control for my experiment. Oh, That's why he was so excited I about see. this, because they could raise one as a girl, one as a boy. And according to his theories that uh, gender had nothing to do with biology, had no basis in biology, that they that they would essentially both both be raised as perfectly healthy, normal functioning adults. I believe there are at least two other similar stories. They were male, male to female uh, problems due to misadventures and whatnot and ambiguous genitalia. And they usually end in suicide. And why isn't that being discussed anymore today by the, by the community that's trying to find the right treatments for transgender individuals? I'm not sure. Money was also involved in a lot of uh, intersex or what used to be called hermaphrodite people where they have ambiguous genitalia. And one of the reasons excuse me, that he's vilified today, even in the intersex community, is that he was big on pushing them to, as he said, correct their genitalia in order to make them look mm. all male or all female. And he, I mean, there were thousands of cases around the world based on his theories where he would push people to get this unnecessary and often mutilating surgery. Mm. And I'm not sure why this isn't Jeez. more of a big scandal. I mean, he really, really ruined a lot of people's lives, even beyond that dramatic case I mentioned of the boy who lost his penis and was raised as a girl. It just, it just feels like it's a piece of history that should be studied very, very carefully. Because I, you can learn so much from these excesses, whether it's the, again, opiates, ice pick. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn here. And, and I would argue, any of you listening to us now have this conversation, that the main lesson you should take is excess, excessive enthusiasm, excessive certainty, excessive. If it, if it just seems like it's a inflated idea that's new, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. I mean, I'm sure there's a million examples in plastic surgery as well. You know, just, just be careful. That, that's all I'm saying. I'm not, not that I'm certain, you know, here's the, here's probably the irony of this, Sam, I bet there are histories of breakthroughs that happen this way and are breakthroughs and help humanity for years to come. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 tough to judge at the time what is going to be seen as, you know, a breakthrough, what's going to be seen as something that's excess where people took things way too far. But I do think that, yeah, that that is a good sort of guideline when you have people going way, way farther than everyone else and pushing things very hard, very fast, kind of the move fast and break things. Pushing. Idea that pushing. Yeah. 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 Pushing is, I think, the thing. It's the enthusiasm, the pushing, the the certainty. It's in in medicine, you have to have humility all the time. Biology, just in biology mm -hmm. generally, you have to be very humble. Or science, in general, like we yeah. think we know what's going on. Yeah, but especially biology. I mean, I I mean, I guess you can have a little less humility in physics if you really have command of the math <laughs> and you're you're certain. The, of the, the consequences the, are a little, uh, a little together. a little a little. Yeah. The different, consequences are a little worse. Uh, yeah. Or less worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe it depends on what we're working on, but, but, uh, the, the, but the, but just the biology is a, is a infinitely, I say it all the time. It's infinitely complex. It's like trying to predict behavior of clouds mm -hmm. and, you 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 got to have a lot of humility and and uh, don't use words like always and never. You just don't use them because they don't really apply. So let, let's take a quick break. I, I have a lot more I want to talk to you about. We also have I think some calls. People I don't know if they're for you, Sam, or not. Um, I want to talk uh, about this interconnection you make between slavery and science. Am I getting that correct? Is that and is that am I saying that correctly? Okay. Slavery and early science. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that. And uh, we will take your calls, uh, and we are watching you on Restream as well, everybody. So we'll see you in just a minute after a quick break.
I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics, and once you try one, you will never go back, trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, it uses all-natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. I'm here with my daughter Paulina to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. It's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right, no kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold, mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale September 21st. And pay no attention to the pre-order call. You can just get it anywhere books are sold, Amazon and whatnot. We just can't get her back in studio until Thanksgiving. Maybe we're going to we get her do, back next week to re Maybe we can re do a new book. Yeah, yeah let's do great. another one. Uh, so, Sam, talk to me about this connection with early, early science and slavery. So basically, way back in when uh, science was getting going, uh, European science in the 1700s or so, there were a lot of people around the world, especially natural historians, who wanted to go visit places like South America, wanted to visit Africa, uh, places like that. But there was really no good way to get down there except on slave ships because governments back then didn't really sponsor scientific voyages. You just had no way to get to the places mm. that they wanted to get to. So essentially, uh, you know, if you were a botanist, you were a zoologist, you wanted to go to these places, you had to hitch rides down on slave ships to get there. And then once you got there, most mm. of the people there, most of the economy in those places was based on slavery. So you had to start trading with slavers. Mm. You had to work with slavers. You really had no choice but to be involved with slavery. 
And so in the book, I kind of talk about, um, you know, that, that sort of general picture, but then also look at one particular case, a, an entomologist, a bug guy named Henry Smithman, who was so obsessed with termites, he loved them, wanted to go down and study them in different places, but he was an abolitionist, and he went down there as a determined foe of slavery, but got so drawn in to the first economy, and then, you know, hitching rides on slave ships, things like that, that he eventually started dabbling in trading slaves himself. And he hated himself for it. He didn't like that he was having to do this, but he figured he had no other way to get the science done because he needed to trade supplies and do things like that. And slaves, sadly, were essentially a commodity that he knew he could trade quite easily for things that he wanted. So it's really a step. You watch somebody break bad step by step by step and kind of cover your eyes in horror at what they are doing to themselves. Yeah. And they, I'm sure and he convinced not, it, himself that he was doing. Go ahead. Yeah, he convinced himself that, you know, th- there was a greater good or that he really wasn't, you know, right. doing it because he wasn't owning the slaves. He was just kind of dabbling or trading them and other people were the ones right. doing that. Right. And eventually he sort of dropped that uh, self-justification. But you can see, again, how he breaks bad step by step. And I do talk a little bit in the book about how he wasn't, sadly, an exceptional case, that especially in certain fields, you just see this over and over, where a lot of the science would not have gotten done had they not been reliant and basically taken advantage of the infrastructure of slavery. And probably the most dramatic example of this was the British Museum which was uh, essentially the core collection of it was gathered by a man named Hans Sloan, who owned plantations in Jamaica and would pay doctors and other people who were traveling on slave ships to collect specimens for him around the world. So even something like the British Museum, one of the great cultural institutions in the world, their core collection was built and founded on things that were gathered via the slave trade. And obviously, it's not something I like to talk about nowadays, but you can see this with a lot of different museums and a lot of different scientific collections where they were built on the backs of the slave trade. Hmm. And... I don't know. I'm sort of speechless after that. It's, it's so sad. And to the same, I guess, to the same degree, there were some scientific advances uh, as a result of the Holocaust. And I believe we may even sort of be, are we still deploying some of those to this day? There are debates about that. Uh, I do discuss it in the book because it's sort of, I mean, you think about scientists going bad. That's one of the big, big ones that sort of flashes up in neon is the experiments they did, doctors did on people during the Holocaust. And most of the experiments that they did on patients were, I mean, there's no, there's no even way you could call them science. They were just cruel. They were torturing them, essentially. Uh, they deserved to be buried and forgotten. But there were a few cases where they did experiments on people, gathered data that for obvious reasons, there's really no other good way to get. One example, probably the most prominent example, was experiments they did on people about hypothermia, where they would hold them down in ice baths, let their body temperatures drop by 10 or even 15 degrees sometimes, and then try to revive them. And there were all sorts of untested folk theories about how to revive people, that you had to give them alcohol, Mm. that you had to, you know, wrap them in a blanket, stuff like that. They even at one point tried putting them in bed with prostitutes to see if they could warm their hearts, get them going that way. I mean, all sorts of ridiculous theories they were trying out. But eventually. that's That's where the term light my fire came from. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it was just these ridiculous folk theories that they were trying out because no one really had an idea of how to revive people when they were that far advanced with hypothermia. Turns out that the Nazis did figure out some of the better ways to revive people. And after the war, and even, you know, it comes up nowadays still, there's a debate about how much we should use this information. 
because it was gathered in a horrific way. It was essentially torture. People died from these experiments, but we do have the data. So do we ignore it and pretend that we don't have this data, or do we use it and try to save people's lives right now? I don't know that there's a good answer, but there are good arguments to be made on both sides. Yeah. I, I, what is the ethics against? Because it seems like if there were a way to make those lives not have suffered in vain, it would be to apply it to the, a greater good. Mm -hmm. That That is the argument a lot of people make. The other argument, though, against that is, well, essentially you are not maybe forgiving, but you're sort of justifying those experiments. And people in the future might mm -hmm. look at that and say, well, you know, you got to break a few eggs. That's the price of progress. Ugh. I hope. Well, I, the, I, I've witnessed so much in the last few years. I, 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 I'm open to anything that humans are capable of, frankly, but I, I hope that's not true. Well, let, let me see if we have a calls for you. We have some questions lighting up. Uh, Casey, is this a, a question for Sam or is this something else? See if I can get him up here. Casey? Well, I have the damnedest time with this. Uh, and there you are. one, two, three. Here we go. There you are. <laughs> hey, Doc. How's it going? Good. Great. Um, yeah, actually, I have a question. Um, actually, for both of you, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is how in the hell did these guys figure out that you could stick a pick into somebody's brain and give them a lobotomy and they would live? Well, yeah, that's an interesting piece. I forget that history. That's a great question. I still don't really understand it. You know, why, how they didn't hit arteries and cause massive bleeding. Sam, do you know that? Well, I mean, they did. Freeman, Freeman killed several patients on the table because he would nick blood vessels all the time and they would bleed out. Um, essentially, what they were Hang trying on, they to they do. Don't, they, don't, they, they don't bleed out. They, they, they bleed in. They bleed in bleed and in. squishes okay, the right. brain because the brain is yeah. a yeah the brain is a is a is a fixed uh, space and if you get bleeding it squashes okay, yeah. everything bleed in there. So, yeah yeah um, my god essentially the idea at the time was they, they the theory about mental illness was that you had the frontal lobes which basically control reason planning things like that and then you have emotional centers deeper inside the brain. And the theory was that the emotional centers were getting so revved up that they were overwhelming the reasoning, controlling, planning parts of the brain. So the point of a lobotomy was to sever the connections between the emotional centers and the reasoning centers at the front of the brain. It's not how doctors would think about it nowadays, psychiatrists would think about it nowadays, but that was the theory at the time. So the ice pick essentially was just to sever the white matter connections between those two parts of the brain and uh, disconnect them. That was the that was the goal of what they were doing. Do, do they was there you know was it based on Phileas Gage? You know, there's a famous case named a guy named Phileas Gage that had a bar that went through his eye and cut off his frontal lobe, and um, had all kinds of strange changes as a result over years as he as time progressed. Um, how did they, I, I just, I don't really understand where they came up with the idea that they felt they could do it. Were they experimenting on animals or something or I, I, how did they get to that point? Do we know? Well, no, that was one of the reasons that, uh, a lot of neurosurgeons were horrified is that Moniz and Freeman basically refused to do any experiments on animals. They were so eager to get to patients that they just jumped right in. Um, essentially, I mean, this was a time where doctors like Wilder Penfield, who was a very famous surgeon, could go in and remove large chunks of the brain to treat epilepsy and other disorders. And, you know, people would have some, maybe some odd symptoms afterward, but they would live. So they knew at the time there were certain parts of the brain, the brainstem, things like that, that you couldn't touch. But the rest of the brain, you know, there were a lot of things that you could take out and people would change afterwards, but they would still be alive mm -hmm. and still function. So they're basically jumping off of legitimate surgeries and just saying, hey, let's take a risk and see what happens here. God, I just, the, to me, the astonishing thing is the bleeding, that there was not more how they missed arteries, how they, even the veins that they must have torn through. I, I just, it's just astonishing to me that there wasn't more catastrophe, but certainly the surgeons were holding their breath, waiting for the catastrophes. 
man, they, they, I can just imagine you're a neurosurgeon and some psychiatrist just sticking ice picks up somebody's eye. And that was in a time of gentlemanliness, right? You didn't, you didn't address your peers in public. You didn't criticize them in public today. Woo -hoo, be a little different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Freeman did uh, partner yeah. with a neurosurgeon at the beginning, but they eventually parted ways because Freeman wanted to do these quickie in and out outpatient neurosurgeon neurosurgeries, essentially. Just unbelievable. Uh, let's uh, get more calls in. Uh, Leopold, let's see if we can get you up here. Hey there. Hey, Dr. Drew, how you doing? I thought you might under you might appreciate Sam and his book. Oh my God! Yes, and I I was thinking about back in the eighties when I was at uh, UC Irvine at in the psychobiology neurobiology department mm -hmm. department in a the class. There was uh, they were talking about this uh, study that was done in the fifties regarding the pleasure uh, region in yeah. the brain yeah. and where the they were talking about how. Uh, uh, when they were, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll finish it for you. So this was okay. the work of Sorry. James, yeah. James Olds at Caltech. That's and, right. And yeah. I actually went to college and high school with his son and he actually mm. did a bunch of research on neurobiology. And, yeah. and what he, they did was they were looking around for the pleasure center That's with electrodes. And what they found was when they hit this one area, which was the nucleus accumbens essentially, and they fired things off, the rats would push the lever for the stimulation until they died. What they missed was there is a disconnect between the part of the brain that experiences pleasure, like good euphoria, versus the motivational system that says, do that again. These are distinct and overlapping systems. So Olds kind of got it wrong. He found the he found the nucleus accumbens in this, this incredible, powerful do it again system, but it probably doesn't have much to do with pleasure. Now, now there was wasn't there a um, where they they actually uh, did this on some human subjects? I think they were trying to cure something, and the human subjects were begging the doctor not to close his brain up. They they wanted that implant in that region. So and they would do nothing else but uh, stimulate it electrically, because and to the extent of not doing anything else, no bathing, no taking care of the kids, yeah. nothing. That was the only thing they wanted. Was Sam, that. Hang on, let's check with Sam. Sam, do you? I I remember some story like that. I did. I don't think it was that clear. But Sam, do you know of a specific event? I don't. I had not heard this story about doing it on humans. I'd heard the the rat study from old, but I had not heard it with humans. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think what you're referring to is something that was done intraoperatively on humans, and they did have this intense desire to do things to keep going. But again, that is not necessarily pleasure, guys. Like cocaine is the greatest example of the do it again stimulation, and trust me, they're not even having pleasure anymore, and they're still behaving like that lab rat. And no matter how psychotic and miserable they get, they keep going. They're not having pleasure. Uh, by the same token. The opiate addicts have almost strictly pleasure, and the do-it-again system is involved there, but they are having some pleasure in, involved with it. Well, wasn't there some sort of edict uh, in medicine, Dr. Drew, that mm -hmm. talked about that they would never, ever allow that type of uh, stimulation in that area again? In other words, they realized back then that I, it was so I, dangerous. I, these are all, this yeah. all sounds like echoes of things that I sound familiar to me but but i not quite remember them specifically so were you a student then yeah, yeah. back in uh, in the 80s at uc irvine yeah. yeah i don't know if you knew some of the uh richard mcgaw well my Gary, my Gary uncle Lynch. ran a pain medicine program there then that i used to consult with i used to consult oh for rather. and uh so i was over there doing some of that stuff there was a big uh Neuroscience department. It was a great, great operation. Yeah, yeah. Gary Lynch and uh, James McGaw, and uh, over at the medical school, uh, Doctor Zornitzer. Yep. McGaw being the McGaw being the, the grandfather of all that. Yep. All right, Leopold, I'll put you back. Thank you, buddy. All right, thanks. Thank he you. always sounds like he's in a tunnel. Or well, we something. got we have lots of strange sound problems. I know. If you today. guys, okay. So if you ask these guys a question and put them back in the audience. No, no. Just mute your mic while Drew and the guest is talking, so that we don't hear the reverb and okay. also your breath and by the way i didn't mention you can follow sam on sam underscore keen am i pronouncing your name last name correctly i haven't even asked yet keen it is yes it's keen yes 
Okay, good. Uh, K, it's K E A N. Uh, Facebook is Sam Keen Books. You can follow his website at samkeen.com. And the podcast, The Disappearing Spoon. Tell us about that. Yeah, so basically, uh, I come across all these really cool, interesting stories all the time that I want to tell, that I enjoy, but they just don't fit in my books because the books, you know, I, I do enjoy meandering sometimes, but they usually have a central theme. So I've written books about the periodic table. I've written books about the human genome. I've written books about the human brain. And uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they are pretty focused on one topic. And I come across all these other great stories, and the podcast is just a way to put them out there, have a little bit of fun, um, and, yeah, make these stories uh, just something that I want to do. I, I wonder if you'd be willing to share a couple stories with this group that you've, you've potted about that, that stay with you or that trouble you or surprise you or yeah, I, I mean, or, so I give a lot of you. I give a lot of book talks, um, and one question I always get is, you know, are there any stories you found that you wanted to include in the book that you just didn't for whatever reason? And in this season of my podcast, I talk about one one big story that I would have included in my genetics book, which is about a very rare and unusual type of cancer. Uh, there was a doctor named Percival Pott in the late 1700s, who noticed that there were a lot of chimney sweeps, uh, sort of the uh, classic, iconic um, uh, London chimney sweeps, who were coming down with Mary a type of cancer. Mary Poppins, yeah. But as, as I explained in the podcast, Mary Poppins sadly was uh, kind of misleading, kind of a fraud, because most of these chimney sweeps led lives that were short and kind of awful because they would come down with a very specific type of cancer in a very specific part of the male anatomy. They would come down with scrotal cancer. And it's a very rare, very unusual type of cancer, but they would get it based on the fact that they were often in chimneys from the time they were four or five years old, scrambling up and down inside these chimneys. Uh, often they were naked when they were doing this because they were filthy dirty and they figured, well, you know, why get these boys clean? They're just gonna be dirty again the next day. Why dress them up in clothes? Their clothes are going to get filthy. So they would spend all day going up and down chimneys naked. And the coal soot from the, uh, from the chimneys would get ground into their skin. And it turns out, sadly, that there are certain carcinogens in coal that affected cells in the scrotum more than other cells. And they would come down with this unusual yeah. type of cancer. So I talk about, yeah. uh, you know, the fact that, that cancer is a... It, it's a very rare disease, and no, very people don't get it anymore. It was a very specific time frame where they were coming down with it, essentially because it was an occupational hazard. This was kind of the sort of occupational medicine where your job would give you a certain disease. Yeah. That was, uh, you know, coal miner's lung, mesotheliomas, things like that. Asbestos. Yeah, yeah asbestos that came later. Uh, I'm pulling up another call here to see if there's something more for Sam. Uh, hmm, as usual, having trouble getting the calls up. <laughs> have, have I missed anything or mischaracterized or uh, left anything out from the book that you want people to know about it? Well, um, I mean, there, there are a lot of dark stories in the book, but there are a few fun stories, I think, in the book as well. Uh, cases where scientists got a little nasty, but they got a little nasty with each other more than they did other people. So, for example, there were two paleontologists in the book, one named Cope, one named Marsh, who started off as friends but quickly became enemies because they had very different, very clashing personalities. And basically, they went out west at a time when people really didn't know much about fossils, didn't know much about the past. And especially, as I discuss in the book, this was a time when dinosaurs were just an obscure taxon of lizard. No one knew anything about dinosaurs, except until Marsh and Cope came along, and they were the ones who made dinosaurs dinosaurs. They discovered Triceratops, they discovered Stegosaurus, they discovered Brontosaurus, or Apatosaurus as we now call it. They were the ones who made them this iconic species. 
And part of the reason they were such good paleontologists is because they had this rival always looking over their shoulder. The rival pushed them. The rival made them work harder. They ranged farther. They stayed out later in the season because they knew their rival was going to get them if they didn't. And so you see them do kind of terrible things to each other where they would sabotage each other. They would send their uh, diggers around to throw rocks at the other people. They would blow up their dig sites with dynamite. But in the end, paleontology in general ended up benefiting because of their rivalry. They died penniless. They died bitter. They hated each other. But science in general benefited from their rivalry. And was that the 19th century? When, when was that? Late 1800s, and they both died right around the turn of the century. So late 1800s. Yeah. Cope Where and Marsh, were they doing the that The Bone work? Wars. I'm just curious. They were doing most think, of it out west. So book? they started off on the East Coast. What's that? Did you write that book? Bone out in the West, you know, basically from yeah. They were it was called the Bone Wars, yeah. It's basically from western South Dakota mm -hmm. out through Utah. And uh, I mean, mm. I don't think a lot of people understand just what a bonanza this was for fossil hunters. There's an anecdote out there, apparently true, that there was a shepherd in Wyoming who wanted to build a house for himself. And he essentially built it out of dinosaur bones that were just lying around on the ground. There were so many dinosaur bones lying around that he essentially built himself a log cabin out of dinosaur bones and wow. lived in it. I mean, there were fossils everywhere oh out there. It was just a bonanza. And <laughs> Marsh and Cope were the ones who swept in and kind of took advantage of that. Incredible. Well, listen, mm -hmm. it's been a privilege to talk to you. Uh, the book, I suggest everyone go get it, read it. Uh, let's put it up on the screen again there. Uh, there it is, The Ice Pick Surgeon, which is also murder, fr few, fraud, sabotage, piracy, <laughs> and other dastardly deeds perpetrated in the name of science. And I think you get a taste of how crazy it's gotten, and particularly in biological and medical circles. You can follow Sam on his website at samkeen.com. Podcast, The Dispering Spoon. I assume wherever you get podcasts, yes? Yes. Yep. And, uh, Stitcher, Twitter's Apple, I do whatever. Sam yeah. unders underscore, Sam underscore K-E-A-N. Sam, it's been a privilege. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us. Well, thanks for having me. You got it. Farewell to Sam. I'm going to go back over to our restream and see if you guys have any questions over there. So, Susan, you're laughing about something? I don't know. Just, he's cute. So that was interesting. I, I, knew, I want to read more of his books because I, I, I like the way he puts things in historical context. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Well done. Michelle Poe having booked that one. Very, very good. She's, uh, a, very, she's a big bookie. Do you guys like that one? People, there was a lot of uh, buzz on the restream. Like, this is, well, this is a different show. We got to work on the the uh, clubhouse callers though just like if if we're talking and it's you're not talking just put, put, put yourself on mute and then you can unmute yourself when you're ready to talk okay it just helps the sound okay it sounds weird uh i think caleb can fiddle with it but it would be easier and then no speaker phones i like that your picture always appears next to me there when we're talking i know it's fine. I'm always like you could you could we could set up a camera. Bear. We could set up a camera for you over there. I want the long shot though. I I don't like the little. It's a good square. one. Don't be silly. Yeah, but I the, like the, to see shoulders and boobs. The, <laughs> perfectionist. <laughs> the long shot. Uh, uh, all right. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. Whatever. All right. So anything else, guys? I'm looking at your restream. Any questions? This is live. New temp phone ash. This is live. Uh, when am I going to be a guest on how did this get made with Chris? Uh, is that for Sam? Are you asking me? Um, I don't know. I don't know that I have any answers to a lot of these things. Is that, is that just a show that I don't know that show? Uh, who is the second lady? That is Susan Pinsky. It is live. Uh, we're live right now. If you guys have, we have any a new person on Twitch, welcome, welcome, welcome yep. to our 22 uh, people on Twitch. Uh, See, Fred Cauliflower says, I'm way out of your league. You're way out of my league, rather, which I would agree. Uh, <laughs> that is true. Uh, oh, thank you, Fred Cauliflower. And we have there, uh, what's the best oncology unit in Southern California? Jeanette's mom, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, Leopold, um, it depends what she has. Uh, you know, obviously City of Hope is a, is a major center. Uh, UCLA would be the other one. 
Um, those, those would be your two. Uh, the fact that we're talking about lung, adrenal, and head, it's probably lung is what you're talking about. And I would bet UCLA might be your best bet there. Now, I'm sorry to hear about that. That is a rough one. Um, all right, eight-year-old and COVID vaccine. What are my thoughts? Um, these are tough decisions. I would ask you to make it with your pediatrician. That's what I would suggest. We did a whole pod on this two days ago. Yesterday. With- or day before yesterday. Uh, I can tell. Oh, is it yesterday? No. I don't believe it was yesterday. Day before yesterday with, with Dr. Je- Jessica Hodge. Hockman. Yeah. Hockman. And you can watch that. And she talks a lot about the, making the decision as a pediatrician. Uh, it's not an easy decision. It's not uh, yeah, easy. It would be hard for me. It, but it's it's it looks safe. I'm still a as strongly vaccine advocate. But I don't know if you noticed today, the FDA appealed to a federal judge to lock away their proceedings around the vaccine for 50 years to hide from us whatever it was that went into their decision making um i i'm you can't help but think whatever is in that those documents is not good uh, talk about the streisand effect man i cannot imagine a more powerful way than that to create that uh, kind of interest in something that we shouldn't be thinking about the fda should have just done their thing they should have been transparent with all of us about what their thinking is right. i understand there are risks the risks are worth it. You're saying that. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. But to but not then they're share also thinking, putting it on the doctors to make the decision. And well, it's but like, we're sort of in a better position, even without that data. With even without it, we can say we get a sense of how it's working and not working, and who should get it, not get it. So, uh oh, what's that? Thirty degrees outside. Kid was crying. Where's Chris? I don't know what you're telling us about a kid with no coat. I don't know why. That, that's a sad story. Uh, Roy, I don't know what was a decade ago. We're, we're talking about the vaccine research done two years ago, uh, the mRNA visa, and how they, remember, two FDA officials resigned over the, those negotiations. Yeah. My suspicion is there was a lot of bad stuff, and they decided it was worth it to get the world going again. I think they were right. I think they were right. Uh, you know, Steve Kirsch thinks they were maybe not right. I yeah. think they were right. I still, I had, I had my family vaccinated. I Susan revaccinated and got a booster. I I'm lived. recommending boosters to many of my patients. I was recommending the boosters before the FDA approved it because it looked like I knew that would be a, there would be approval for, uh, people, particularly over the age of 75. There was no doubt in my mind that, uh, that would be the case. So uh, I was, I was, it was clear that people who are higher risk should be more thoroughly vaccinated. It's also clear that all the vaccines wane over time. It's also clear that natural immunity wanes over time, though um, it's probably the case that hybrid immunity is something we should be looking towards. So again, mm-hmm. Steve Kirsch disagrees disagree strongly with me on that. Uh, I had my uh, additive score done again. It's something you've heard me talk about over the last year or so. And my immunity has gone up since I was last tested about two, three months ago, mm-hmm. which suggests I was re-exposed to COVID. So probably, what? yeah, that's what that suggests. It probably suggests somewhere along the way I was re-exposed to it. My body fought it off and raised the immune level as a result of that uh, subclinical infection. Did you give it to me? No, I did not give it to you. I didn't give it to anybody because <laughs> I didn't get infected. I didn't get infected, but my immune system charged up in response I guess. to it. I don't know. It's a theory. That's a or theory. Or maybe your test was just right one time. Or maybe I've just gone up. Is I, that the one where they lost the vial of blood and you had to give some more? Uh, yes, but the one I gave was just right. And uh, there and there was, um, uh, it's my neutralizing antibodies went up, which is, and so did some of my spike protein and whatnot. So it's possible there's been some data about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine having a really sustained, even increasing immunity over time. Maybe it's because I got the J&J. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Again, humility when it comes to biology. Sam's conversation today was a perfect reminder of that. So again, what's coming up uh, next Mr. week? Mr. Toby77 said, Drew, if this is live right now, I apologize, but I still can't think this is real. Can't think it's real? Yeah, he just can't believe it's re- it's live. Uh, it is because I just said it. Yeah, so. we're reading your restream. Uh, <laughs> we're reading your chat uh, entry there, so... Uh, and then, and then, uh, Caleb just put up a little live bar on the screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we have coming up next week, Jay Bhattacharya, the following week, Alex Berenson and Vinay Prasad. He always pulls that stuff out of his And, uh, we're, we're arsenal. thinking about if you guys have suggestions for other guests that you'd like me to talk to, uh, send it over to contact at drdrew.com. We are, we are thinking about other ways of doing this and other people to talk to. It no, just write like, it on the restream. It's easier for me. Well, if we see it on the restream here, but if you I think of it later. so many emails, it's just like, ugh. 
Um, Lindsay loves dogs. We've been on Twitch for quite some time. Uh, yeah, we've, we've been on for a while. Yeah, Twitch is not, you know. It's an, just, it goes away after a month, so you can't see our whole list of shows. If you want to see our other shows, they're on YouTube and Twitter. Well, Twitter doesn't have the Periscope list anymore, so you can find them on YouTube or Facebook. Unless we were censored on YouTube. And sometimes we've been censored on YouTube, and so we will come off and just go over to Rumble. Ask Dr. Drew. This show is also on Rumble. And we have a podcast. So if you want to hear it in podcast form, go over to uh, you iTunes or whatever, you know, wherever you get your podcast, and look up Ask Dr. Drew. And all of the platforms and, are at uh, drdrew.tv. Oh, thanks. Dr. Thanks, Dr. God. TV, you can get it all there. It's the voice of God, or Caleb Nation, as we like to call him. Uh, there, there's one last thing I was going to say, which is that we we find that it seems like um, controversial guests or guests with sort of uh, non-mainstream opinions interest you guys. I, so I'm happy to interview them. I may not adopt their point of view, but I do. You know, I'm strong believer in the First Amendment. I am interested in hearing some of these ideas, and so that's you know that's sort of what we try to do here. So if you have any ideas, we will happily talk to that person. So thank you, Caleb. Thank you, Susan, for producing this. Thank you to Michelle Poe for booking it. And we'll be back again, I believe it is, Tuesday. yes, on Tuesday. That is our next show. Uh, oh, no, Susan, you have Monday with uh, Dr. Patterson. Yeah, Dr. Patterson's oh. coming back on to talk about their, you know, COVID, COVID so long haulers. You, Dr. Yo and Dr. Patterson info. have been doing sh tons of research on long COVID since we last talked to them. They are coming up with lots of very interesting, complicated observations, but it's time for them to give us a little report. So that is going to be an exclusive here. We got a suggestion for a guest on there. Did you see it? Uh, no. <laughs> Where is it? It's a porn star. Oh, who is it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to say it. Can you guys put it up there again so I can say it? Unless Susan... there's a doctor with the same name as a porn star. there That could be, I don't know. Uh, it's, I don't, maybe you blocked that person where I can't see it. No, it's, it's scroll up. It was a while ago. Very okay. funny. Well, I mean, we, I, we could talk. To, <laughs> uh, oh no, that's not a, that's uh, so, oh, by the way, Susan had went and Alana went to great lengths to get this going. Let me see if I can get it where it's boop, over boop. here. No, over here. It, they're uh, sitting in the port. Just nope, put it in front way. of your face. Okay. Here it is. There Isn't it is. that cute? There it is. It's uh, coming out for the holidays if they can, uh, unload the container with it in there so in the port of long beach with the other 50 it's a bobbleheads i can't believe those ships are just sitting out there and past christmas i mean yeah. think of a pollution in the just the well that's how we got our our uh I know. Oil leakage, but i mean though. even that like there's just so much petrol in the water and and they flush their toilets in there and ugh. okay uh that's it guys thank you for being here we will see you on monday with dr patterson bruce patterson <laughs> sorry i did Throw that in. What did I hear general. somebody say the other day? They go, "I love my husband, even though I want to tear his eyeballs out a lot of the time." Oh yeah. And I thought, I but but it, normally they, they wouldn't say it quite it. that violently. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, I thought it caught mm -hmm. my ear. I was like, "Oh, this is interesting." There's more more explicit violence, which I don't mind as a sub. It's it is. <laughs> 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 You've got your harness on under that. I wish you took your shirt off when there was like your bondage gear. I had a bunch Love of that. nipple rings yeah, and like, with leather. Jeez, this is a whole new lane for you. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.